Well, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I thought I would begin my remarks uh, at the end. Um, you see, uh, on many occasions when I have completed my presentation, someone will ask me how I adopted the name Mark Twain. And I like to reply with a little story. Years ago, when my daughters were very young, oh, I took them on a trip to Keokuk, Iowa, to visit their dear aging grandmother. And we went by way of the lakes. It was an enjoyable excursion. We spent a day or two in Duluth, and then a day or two in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then we boarded a steamboat, and we headed down river to Keokuk. Now, in my book, Good Times on the Mississippi River, I explained that the phrase Mark Twain is the leadsman's call. It, it's a measure of distance, of depth of water. And in this case, Mark Twain is two fathoms or 12 feet. Now, if my lovely daughters ever knew this information, uh, well, they would have forgotten it by the time we boarded that Mississippi steamboat. That night, I was standing alone on the hurricane deck astern, and we entered a shoal crossing. And in a moment or two, I heard the big bell forward ring out for the leads. And then the night wind carried to me the sound of the leadsman, a haunting, melodic sound that I had once known so well and had forgotten over the years. It was a sound that I was familiar with, but would no longer hear again. Half three, quarter three, mark three, half twain, underwater twain, Mark Twain, Mark Twain. And so it continued. And suddenly, the figure of my tiny daughter Clara appeared on the hurricane deck with a look of rebuke and reproach on her face. Papa! Well, dear, Papa, I have looked all over this boat for you. Don't you hear them calling your name? Well, such are the way of children. I've written many books about children, boys mostly. And I conceive that the right way to write a book for boys is to write it so that it not only interests boys, but strongly interests any man who's ever been a boy. This immensely enlarges the audience. I recall as a young boy, maybe 10 or 11 years old, uh, I was a prisoner. My friends had all gone holidaying, a river frolic of some sort, but I had committed a small mischief, and this was to be my punishment. I must spend my lonely afternoon looking out our third floor window. Now, I had one comfort, and it was a generous one while it lasted. It was the half of a long and broad watermelon, fresh and red and ripe. And I gouged it out with my knife and managed to accommodate the whole of it in my person, though it did uh, crowd my, uh, well, the juice ran out my ears. <laughs> But now there remained the shell, the empty shell. It was big enough to do duty as a cradle. I didn't want to waste it, but I couldn't think of anything to do with it that would afford entertainment. So I watched out the window upon the sideway, three floors below, when it occurred to me that I'd drop it on somebody's head. Now, I doubted the judiciousness of this, and uh, I had some compunctions about it, too, because it 
seemed to me that the resultant entertainment would fall to my share and very little to the other person's, but I thought I would chance it. So I watched out the window for the right person to come along, that is, the safe person, but they didn't come. Every time there was a candidate, he or she turned out to be an unsafe one. But at last, the right one came along. It was my brother, Henry. Now, Henry was the best boy in the whole region. He was exasperatingly good. He had an overflowing abundance of goodness but not enough to save him this time. He came strolling along, dreaming his pleasant summer dream, never doubting that Providence had him in his care. Well, if he knew where I was, he would have had less faith in that superstition. <laughs> I poised the watermelon calculated my distance, and let it go, hollow side down. The accuracy of my gunnery is beyond explanation. <laughs> he had exactly six steps to make when I let that canoe go. If he had had five steps to make or seven steps to make, why, my gunnery would have been a failure but he had exactly the right number of steps to make, and it was wonderful watching those two bodies close in on each other. Why, it smashed him on the top of his head and drove him in the ground up to his chin. <laughs> Pieces of watermelon flying in the air like spray. Well, I wanted to go down there and console him, I mean, but that would not have been safe. He would have suspected me at once. And I expected him to suspect me, so I watched him for two or three days and nothing occurred. So I thought I was safe. Then suddenly, a cobblestone hit me on the side of the head and raised a bump so large I had to wear two hats for a time. It was Henry. I wanted to take this crime to my mother, but because uh, I was always trying to get him into trouble, you know. But I hesitated. Finally, I showed it to her and she said, it was no matter. She said I probably deserved it, and I should gain a lesson from it. Hmm. Henry died on the Mississippi River on a steamboat accident many years later. As a youth, there was but one permanent ambition among my comrades on the west bank of the Mississippi, and that was to be a steamboatman. In those days, a steamboat pilot was the most unfettered and entirely independent person on the earth. Oh, we had other transient ambitions, but they were only transient, you know. When a circus came to town, why, it left us all burning to be clowns, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we hoped and we prayed, if we were good and we lived, that God would permit us to be pirates. <laughs> but those ambitions, they faded away each in their turn. But the ambition to be a steamboatman always remained. In the heyday of the steamboating prosperity while the river was flaked with coal fleets and lumber rafts, all managed by hand, a crew of two dozen men or more, three or four wigwams scattered around the Raft's vast level surface for storm shelter. We used to swim out there a quarter, a third of a mile, and we'd get on those rafts for a ride. And we'd listen to those rugged rivermen brag about their prowess and boast about their strength and frighten little boys like us who only dreamed of living such a perfect life as theirs. <laughs> I can remember one big bearded fella. Oh, he could brag. He was full of braggadocia. He used to say, I am the iron-jawed, brass-mounted, copper-bellied corpse-maker from the wilds of Arkansas. Look at me. 
I'm the man they call sudden death and total desolation, sired by a hurricane, damned by an earthquake, half-brother to the cholera, and nearly related to the smallpox on my mother's side. Look at me. I take 19 alligators and a barrel of whiskey for breakfast when I'm in a robust mood, and a bushel of rattlesnakes and a dead body when I'm ailing. I split the everlasting rocks with my glance. I squinch the thunder when I speak. Stand back and give me room, boys. Blood is my natural drink. And the wails of the dying is music to my ears. Lady low, hold your breath. For I am about to turn myself loose. <laughs> yeah. Pilot in a steamboat on the Mississippi River was not work for me. It was play, adventurous play, delightful play, and I loved it. But when the Civil War came along, steamboat traffic on the Mississippi River came to an end. So did my career as a steamboat pilot. Well, I thank you for your attention today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are all at liberty to attempt an escape. Thank you.